Hear the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Glory For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire labourers for his vineyard. And after agreeing with the labourers for their usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and he said to them, You also go into the vineyard, and I'll pay you whatever is right. So they went. And he went out again about noon, and about three o'clock, and he did the same thing. And about five o'clock he went out and found others standing around, and said to them, Why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, Because no one has hired us. He said to them, You also go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, Call the labourers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first came, they thought they'd receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, These last only work one hour, and you've made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. He replied to one of them, Friend, I'm doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give them <coughs> to this last the same as I give to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Are you envious because I'm generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Nikki and I have been watching a series on Netflix called Shtissel. And Shtissel, it's an odd name, it's actually a Yiddish name. It follows the fortunes of a family, the Shtissel family, who live in a suburb of Jerusalem inhabited by Hasidic Jews. Those are the ones with the side girls and the little hats. And so their life, in some respects, is very kind of intense, intensely kind of devotional and observant of the law. But in other words, it's a very quiet life because they're deeply suspicious of a lot of modern technology and things, so they don't actually do much, <laughs> and quite a lot of them are unemployed. So, in some respects, it's a very quiet, kind of sleepy kind of life. It's a really odd mixture. And it's contemporary, it, you know, there, it really is happening like that now in Jerusalem. And as I was preparing for this, it, it suddenly occurred to me, there's two kids in the, in the series. The, uh, the grandson of the old man Shtissel, Shulem Shtissel, sorry, the granddaughter of Shulem, meets this kid, he's about 16, and the two of them decide to get married. And the boy is called Hanani, and the girl is called Ruchami. And those two names mean compassionate and gracious, exactly as it says in the psalm, in the last verse, the Lord is gracious, and in Hebrew, Ruchami, compassionate. And it kind of suddenly clicked with me what the series is about. It's about compassion and grace. Because the people need to be reconciled. They need to forgive. And the kind of summation of it all is the, is the two weddings. The useless boy, Kive, who couldn't get his act together until he's 27, and the two kids, who are just teenagers. Interestingly, the two brothers, who are endlessly feuding, are called Shulem and Nochem. And those two names mean peace and comfort. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's a bit ironic that peace and comfort are endlessly feuding, but at the end, compassion and grace bring two of them together. And this, these readings are all about the Lord's compassion and his grace, his peace and his comfort. The parable of the vineyard was, was illustrated in the Renaissance by a reasonably famous painting. And the, the art critic Andrew Graham Dixon featured it in his series of programmes about German art. And he had an inkling that there was a theological message in the picture, but he wasn't quite sure what it was. Credit to him, because when Kenneth Clark was covering the same ground in the series Civilization, he didn't even acknowledge a theological <laughs> component to the picture at all. At least he knew it was there. And the idea of the vineyard is a strong image in Scripture. If you read the Prophets and the Psalms, they talk about Israel as a vineyard. 
the, um, in one of the Psalms, it says how the Lord planted this vineyard, how it covered the hills, and then how the, the walls of the vineyard were torn down and the animals of the forest came in to root it up and eat the fruit and all this kind of thing. And it's talking about the way that Israel flourished and spread and then was crushed in the series of wars and then despoiled. And the idea of the workers in the vineyard in the New Testament becomes the idea of the kingdom of heaven. The vineyard is the Lord's planting. Jesus says, I am the true vine. My father is the gardener. And the vineyard is the place where the vines live. So in this, in this parable, the people in the kingdom of heaven are the workers in the vineyard. They're called to their wage, and then they go. So it's a kind of, it illustrates how we respond to a call, how the Lord wants us to work, and how we'll get a reward. But the curious thing about this one, and a lot of parables, if you like, explore that difference between the normal expectations of the world and the way that God does things. The thing about this is that everyone gets the same, the same wage. And as some of them point out, but we've borne the heat of the day, the burden of the day, why don't we get more? We've worked for it. And these others have hardly done a thing. And you can see the same sentiments with, with Jonah. And it actually talks about the heat as Jonah's camped out in the desert outside Nineveh watching to see what would happen. The heat bears down on him and crushes him and he feels dizzy and faint with it. But that heat is, if you like, describing Jonah's life as a prophet and that he for a very long time has been faithful to the Lord. He has borne faithful witness to the Lord. He has spoken the word of the Lord. He was sent to Nineveh and Nineveh was a terrible place. It was a horrible place. It says in one of the prophets of the Old Testament, who has not felt your endless cruelty? And there's a, a series of panels in the British Museum called the Latchish Panels, in which they celebrate the destruction of Israel from Nineveh. And it shows people being flayed and decapitated and mutilated and all this kind of thing. They were horrible. So when Jonah was reluctant to go and take the word of the Lord to Nineveh, it's because they were horrible. They were really, really horrible. They were cruel. <laughs> and they had caused untold suffering on his own home country. And now the Lord has said to Jonah, go to your country's enemies, the ones that have done such terrible things to you, the ones that have done evil to you and destroyed you and murdered your people and robbed you and everything else, go to them and tell them to repent. And Jonah says, I don't want them to repent, I want them to die. I want them to suffer for what they've done. And the, and the reason that Jonah is so reluctant is because he has this terrible suspicion that if he takes that message of repentance to the Ninevites, they might even repent. And then, God forbid, that they will turn to the Lord and then the Lord will spare them. Why? Because the Lord is gracious and compassionate. And he knows it and he's infuriated by it because he loathes the Ninevites. And the whole thing plays out exactly as he was afraid of. He goes there eventually, he tells the message, the Ninevites hear it and they repent. And for the normal preacher, that you'd say, wow, excellent, I've made it. But Jonah says, oh no, I can't bear it. These people are going to live. The Lord will be gracious to them and merciful and kind and good because that's what he's like. Oh no, these people are my hate and I'm going to receive the Lord's blessing. And it's the same sentiment that's in the parable of the vineyard, isn't it? People that got up at sunrise, went out and worked all day in the heat. At the end of the day, they're tired and they're hot and they're sweaty and they're dusty and they're hungry. And they've worked for their money. Now they're queuing up to get their pay. And they're galled that those loafers who spent the whole day sitting in the shade by the fountain have got the same money. Why? Because the Lord is gracious. If you like, according to our standards, our understanding, he's, if you like, stupidly gracious, ridiculously gracious. But the other side of this is that the workers that didn't come didn't get anything. 
and the destruction threatened to Nineveh was real. And if you re read in that letter to the Philippians, he says, live a life worthy of the Lord. Because the way that it provokes your enemies, if you like, proves their destruction is near. There's always this background of the two. On one hand, there's a repentance which leads to life, following the calling to receive the reward. On the other hand, the Lord hates evil, even more than we do. And one thing that struck me as I was reading this thing about Jonah was that the Lord says, you suffered because of the, that, that bush, that plant, which you didn't even plant yourself, it just grew up. He said, shouldn't I be concerned for the city? And it struck me that the Lord feels the evil of the city. The Lord himself feels that evil that they have done. If you remember the story of Noah, it says the Lord has pained, he was grieved. Because the evil in every man's heart. The Lord was pained and grieved by the evil of Nineveh. He felt it more, if you like, than Jonah felt the heat of the day and the terrible sense of loss of his shade when the bush died. The Lord compared his pain and suffering with Jonah's pain and suffering. If you like, he gave Jonah an insight into how he feels about our evil. He feels the terrible pain and loss. And we are cheerfully oblivious to it most of the time. But nevertheless, he feels it. And he wants it to stop. He wants it to stop because he hates it. And he wants it to stop because the people whom he has made he wants to live. He wants them to repent. He wants them to receive their reward. He really wants them to do the right thing so that in the end he can reward them. He wants that way possible so that he can pour out his grace on them. Because it's his joy and his glory to be gracious. The psalm celebrates the greatness and the power and the majesty and the goodness of the Lord. And all the time it's going on about it, it doesn't actually explain why he is so great. Until you get to this last verse there, which is in the quote. The Lord's greatness is because he is gracious and merciful, long-suffering and of great goodness. That word long-suffering there, in Hebrew, she reads long nostrils. <laughs> because the word for anger is expressed in nostrils in Hebrew. So if you have a short nostril, it means you're hot tempered and quick to anger. If you have a long nostril, it means you're patient and forbearing and slow to anger. So the Lord has long nostrils in this verse. But he is kind and gracious. That's the main point. He is slow to anger. He is born with the evil of the Ninevites for some time. He's watching it grow. And now it's had enough. And he says, Jonah, go there because if they don't stop, it's going to finish. I will finish them. Let's give them a chance to get out before the axe falls. And they took their chance. They went out. Like the workers in the market waiting to be hired, they came out. And they got the reward. And what Jonah couldn't stand was they're basically in the same position with God as he was. He who had been faithful his whole life long, in his calling as a prophet, and now these Ninevites, these disgusting Ninevites who have done nothing but evil their whole lives long, are now on a level with him just because they repented. And sometimes if you think about some people become Christians as children. They live their whole life in the knowledge of God. Some people become Christians on their deathbeds. Their life with Christ is just a flicker. And yet they receive the same reward. The same prize. The same to Steve, his name Stephanos, is the wreath, the crown, 
to reaching heaven. They receive the same crown. They receive the same heaven. The Lord is gracious. And it's his joy and his glory to be gracious. And his generosity is to all his people. And it's partly a, a, a rebuke to us if we're resentful about that, but partly, partly an encouragement for us to rejoice with him. That when we see someone turn from their evil or turn to the Lord, or when we see someone enter heaven, to be glad. As Paul says, to be remain with you will be for your good, he says, but Part of me just wants to go. I've had enough. I want to be with the Lord. It's good. But he says, I'm content to remain for now for your benefit. Paul's very conscious of this thing. He's a labourer in the vineyard. He's one long and faithful service. He's borne the heat of the day and the burden of it. But he's simply glad for anyone to share it with him. He's the faithful servant. 